So good day, everyone, and welcome to the summer solstice on the Northern Hemisphere and the longest night in the Southern Hemisphere. I'm very delighted to introduce to you Sebastian Baza, uh, oh gosh, Banazak. Now, all you Polish, can you please correct me on that terrible pronunciation? So it's Sebastian Banazak from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And what is interesting about this talk is something we really have to do something today with very massive binary, supermassive black holes. It's going to be a rather captivating subject because these supermassive black holes are masses that are millions to a billion times heavier than our sun. And it's probably something that's quite rare. At least Sebastian will tell us a lot more. Sebastian, welcome. How are you? Thank you so much, Christian. I'm doing well. I'm doing well. And don't feel bad about the pronunciation. It's my last name and I still know how to pronounce it. So it's all good, but if anybody wants to correct me, feel free. Um, but yeah, <clears throat> I'll go ahead and start the presentation. Uh, thank you for the introduction, first of all, and thank you all so much for coming to the presentation. Um, I love presenting this stuff no matter what, but to do it for a live audience is just even better. So really appreciate you guys for all coming out to watch this. Now, today, uh, and Christian, interrupt me if you can't see um, the presentation, but there we go. It's sure. good. It's good. Beautiful. So yeah, today we're going to be talking about supermassive black hole binaries and my research specifically on how we detect them using light. Okay. So I'm fully aware that most of those words made no sense to a lot of you, but we're going to spend a decent amount of time building up to that. Okay. Talking about what supermassive black hole binaries are, why they're cool, why they're important and why we research them. All right. Then I'll be getting uh, into my research specifically, which is how we detect them using light. Uh, it gets a little more specific. I'm still going to be doing a surface level analysis of it for the most part. But if anybody has any more specific questions, please feel free to ask. And I'm more than happy to talk about it at the end. Um, and then at the end, just real quick, we'll be touching on the future of this project because my research specifically, I guess the paper that I'm going to publish will probably wrap up within the next few months. But this project isn't going anywhere. You know, this this is a really big topic. It's a new field. Um, and I see it continuing for the next five to 10 years and incorporating some really, really cool, really cool things. So I'll start off with asking you guys. I just kind of want to get a get an understanding of where you guys are in terms of your knowledge about black holes in general. So if you want to launch uh, the first poll, Christian, that would be great. But yeah, um, black holes, I feel like they're really popular. It might be strange if, if uh any of you haven't heard about them before, but just take a minute to look at this and and let us know how much you know about them. You know, I know they're really popular in popular culture. Maybe you know about them, maybe you've researched them, maybe you've only heard them in songs or from the movie Interstellar. That's totally fine. Um, you should feel no shame about knowing little about black holes. I'm here to I'm here to help you guys out. So yeah, we'll let that go for a couple more seconds. Oh, Sebastian, this is going to be very interesting. You'll see how diverse our our uh audience is it's really stunning so i'm happy i'm happy for it yeah <laughs> and like i said i geared this a little bit more towards the general audience but if anybody has more clarifying questions or deeper questions about this stuff please feel free to ask i'm more than happy to talk about it or discuss it okay this is going to be interesting i can see as it evolves so let's give it another 30 seconds and then i'll share it all right sounds good yeah and really no imposter syndrome here i've researched these things for a year and still barely know anything about them so really don't feel bad if you don't know anything or don't, don't know much but it'll be cool if anybody does research on jim them. is saying uh, jim is saying film event horizon yes that's the... <laughs> there we go there we go yep <laughs> although always the popular culture references all right okay so what do you think sebastian okay okay learned okay good that's kind of what i expected good to hear good to hear all right so I'll give you guys a little bit of an introduction to them, and then we can hopefully get into the more complicated stuff of supermassive black hole binaries. So supermassive, or sorry, black holes in general, they form at the end of a massive star's life. Okay, when the star, when a star about the size of 10 solar masses or 10 times the mass of our sun is at the end of its life, it runs out of fuel and it collapses in on itself. Okay, now because of how massive it is, there's nothing to stop this collapse. There's no forces strong enough to prevent it from imploding. So it literally will collapse in on itself until it punctures a hole in space time, okay? It, it condenses the mass of an entire star into a point-like singularity. Already, I've abandoned common sense. I'm fully aware of that. 
you guys are going to have to get used to that for the rest of the presentation because it only gets weirder. Now, because we have such an intense amount of mass packed in such a tiny, tiny space, the space and the time around black holes are severely distorted. So like you mentioned, you guys might have heard about the event horizon around a black hole. It's this dark black sphere around this point at the center, around this, this black hole singularity. That marks the region within which, if anything goes, it can't escape, even if it's moving at the speed of light, right? It, it marks the point of no return, right? And if you approach a black hole, maybe even further away from the event horizon, before you're, you go into the event horizon, um, time will pass differently for you. Even the time fields are distorted, right? So to an outside observer, as you approach a black hole, you'll appear to move slower and slower and slower until you freeze on the surface of the event horizon. So the way the very, the very nature of time is distorted when you approach a black hole. And by the way, if you get close enough to a black hole or anything that gets close enough to a black hole will be stretched apart and torn, right? And that the scientific term for that legitimately is spaghettification. Um, but yeah, uh, and, and you'll be stretched apart and spaghettified, whether it's a star, whether it's you or a planet, and you'll be plastered into this hot burning plasma accretion disk around the black hole, all right? And by the way, if a very dense object approaches the black hole, it won't necessarily be torn apart, but instead the two objects will begin to orbit each other until they clash in this, this huge uh, super, I'm sorry, this huge black hole merger. Right? And that merger sends out ripples in the fabric of space-time that are detectable from across the universe. And in fact, we've detected just that. A couple of years ago, 2016, we started to detect those gravitational waves. All right. Now, on top of all those interesting observable effects, black holes represent the, the theoretical crown jewel of physics. Okay, Because right now, we have two very successful theories, quantum physics, which governs the realm of the smallest, and general relativity, which governs the, uh, the realm of the most massive and the fastest. Black holes are proof that these two fields have to fit together. Right now in our theories and on our math, they can't. We, we can't make them match up. But black holes are proof that in the scripture of the universe, the indeterminate infinitesimal world of quantum physics has to play host to the most complicated, massive cosmic distortions of space-time geometry from general relativity. All right. Now imagine all of that just a billion times bigger. Okay. Now I'm just kind of throwing that word out there, but Think about that for a minute. That thing is, is an incredible object. Now imagine it was a million to a billion times bigger. Now we're talking about supermassive black holes, okay? I know super creative name. I don't know how we do it, but supermassive black holes are black holes that are anywhere from about a million times the mass of our sun to a hundred billion times the mass of our sun. And we find them in the centers of, of galaxies, okay? Now, in these centers of galaxies, not only are they just taking part in the typical day-to-day -day activities of a black hole, but they're doing it at, at about a billion times the clip. Because if you know about galaxies, they're really, really big collections of stars, and their centers are very chaotic, dense environments. There's a bunch of star clusters, huge gas clouds, dust collections, right? There's a lot of things going on in the center. So not only does this supermassive black hole behave like just a really big, like massive black hole, but you throw it in this galactic furnace and all of a sudden it starts to exert influence over its entire galactic environment. Okay. Now, in this animation, which is really cool, what we see here is a supermassive black hole actively devouring a star. Okay. When a supermassive black hole is eating something and it has this really hot accretion disk, it's called an active galactic nucleus, an AGN. Okay. I might use that term a lot from here on out. Just know that that's what I'm talking about. A supermassive black hole that's eating something and shining really bright. So an AGN, like I said, not only is just a really massive black hole, but it can interact with this galactic environment through something called feedback. And here are a couple examples of that. For one, positive feedback is when a black hole is eating something and it's shining so, so bright that the sheer amount of photons sweeps up and pushes out huge collections of cool gas and cool dust, which spurs star formations throughout the galaxy. Okay. All right, it can literally, and, and this, this upper right uh, image here is a, is a demonstration of what we think that is, which is a galaxy that's forming a lot of stars, you can see by its incredible brightness, and we think that that star formation was spurred by these AGN feedback, this AGN outflow, okay? On the other hand, uh, the AGN is equally capable of completely shutting off the star formation in the galaxy through these things called relativistic jets, which you see in the animation. As a, a black hole or supermassive black hole is accreting things, 
it can potentially form really, really powerful magnetic fields in its accretion disk. And we think that these are capable of scooping up material and funneling them off into space at near light speed. And this hot charged plasma will crash into the outer wings of the galaxy and completely shut the star formation off, making the galaxy incapable of producing a new generation of stars. Okay. So these things are incredibly, incredibly powerful objects. Not only are, do they affect their, their immediate environment, but they exert influence over their entire galaxy. Okay. Now, this is the second poll, Christian. I'm interested in what you guys think. Um, so after hearing how much power a supermassive black hole has over its host galaxy, let's do a little scale exercise. If we had a galaxy and a supermassive black hole, and we shrunk everything down so it was the size of a grain of sand, okay, so the supermassive black hole is one millimeter across, what would be the proportional size of the host galaxy? I think, yeah, I did the math on this like two weeks ago or something, and it blew my mind, honestly. I, I, it was interesting to learn. Um, it's, it's, it's good to, to start visualizing things. I think one of the most important things about learning this stuff is being able to visualize it and actually connect it. That's just throwing around really nice words is one thing, but learning it is another. Okay, yeah, all right. Maybe it was obvious the way I framed the question. Maybe you guys all have a future in astrophysics, but yeah, the answer is the earth. Yep. Um, the host galaxy would be the size of the earth. And I want you guys to think about that for a second because <clears throat> we just finished saying that a supermassive black hole can call the shots on whether the galaxy is thriving and forming stars or if it's completely dead and quiescent, right? The, the analogy then, I guess, would be if you had a grain of sand on your fingertip, one millimeter across, and it was able to call the shots on whether life continued to exist or whether life perished on Earth, right? It, it seems ridiculous. It sounds unbelievable, but scale-wise, it makes sense. That's what we see. That is what we observe in these galaxies, okay? So these objects are really, really incredible, and any opportunity to study them is more than welcome. So now, let's think about two of them in a binary system, right? If one of them is cool, just imagine what two of them looks like, okay? Now we're talking about supermassive black hole binaries, all right? Now, for, also, by the way, I got this image from Christian. I'm embarrassed to say I never found this when I've given multiple presentations in the past. He just put it up, so it's a really cool image. But it's worth asking, why would we expect two of these things to be together in the first place, right? That's kind of a weird assumption to make. Well, in our most advanced models of the universe, of the history of the universe, we found that Galaxy mergers seem to be really, really important events, right? Um, they seem to dictate a lot about galaxy evolution and about the large scale structure of the universe. And they seem to, uh, you know, dictate a lot about how we got here in, in, in you know, the cosmic time. <clears throat> At the same time, we don't know a great deal about what happens. You know, we have certainly models that, that um, predict how galaxies will merge and overall seem to model the large scale structure of the universe pretty well. But we don't know the specifics that much, you know, the dynamic change uh, uh, that two, ga two galaxies undergo when they merge or the impact to their greater environment if they're in a galaxy cluster or whether or not they will start forming stars really rapidly or whether they're completely dark and quiescent afterwards, right? All of these questions, well, the answers to these questions could potentially be revealed if we study what's happening on this smaller scale, right? At the centers of these two galaxies are two supermassive black holes. And we just finished saying they can influence their whole galaxy. So who's to say that when they come together, they can influence their entire merger event. And this bottom right, we have an image of what we think is two AGN or two supermassive black holes in a merging galaxy uh, starting to approach each other, right? At this point, they're still 10,000 light years apart, um, which means they're not interacting a great, great deal, still potentially interacting. Um, but what we're interested in is when the two supermassive black holes approach each other even closer. And we're talking less than a light year apart, which cosmically is nothing, okay? When this happens, we wouldn't see two distinct glowing dots. We would just see one coalesced bright spot, right? So looking on the sky in a static image, we wouldn't be able to tell the difference between a single AGN and a binary AGN, right? They're too small to image directly and individually resolve, too small and too far, okay? Now, if that was the end of the webinar, it'd be pretty sad. But luckily, there's not only one way that we can detect them, but two completely different avenues that we could detect these objects, despite them being too small to individually resolve. So at these small separations of less than a light year, a thousandth of a light year, 
supermassive black hole binaries or binary AGN will one, emit powerful gravitational waves, right? Which are ripples in the fabric of space-time. You can imagine sticking a pair of chopsticks into a pool of water and spinning the chopsticks. They'll send out circular ripples in the water. It's a similar effect. And two, the supermassive black hole binary will periodically change brightness because of how fast they're moving. Now, just for a moment, I'll explain that. In relativity, fast moving things change brightness, okay? Things that are approaching us at really fast speeds appear brighter. Things that are receding from us at fast speeds appear darker. Being that these objects would be in a circular orbit going around and around and around each other, from our perspective, they'd be periodically approaching us and receding and approaching and receding. So as a result, their brightness would in turn go up and down and up and down. Right, We'd expect a periodic variation in their brightness because of this effect. Now, there's some specifics, but overall, if we can track these objects' brightness and determine that what we're seeing is periodic variability in the brightness, we can then conclude possibly or at least gain evidence for the fact that we're looking at a supermassive black hole binary and not just a single supermassive black hole. All right. Now, using these two different avenues of detection, gravitational waves and light, it's something called multi-messenger astrophysics. It's not mixed martial arts. Um, I thought MMA was a funny term too, but it's what we use, I guess. Um, but yeah, MMA is when we use two different astronomical messengers to study the same system. And it's kind of analogous to looking at a 3D object from multiple angles. The more angles you get, the better you'll understand what the, the object looks like. Same thing here. The more lenses we can look at this system through, the more holistically we'll understand what's happening. And in the case of gravitational waves and light, often the things that limit our, our observation capability in, say, light don't limit our observation capability in gravitational waves and vice versa, right? If the, if the binary is shrouded in a cloud of dust, no light gets to us, but these gravitational waves don't care about the dust. They'll get to us regardless. So we can use these two components to feed off of each other and uh, inform our observations. That's called MMA. So I just overloaded you guys with a lot of information. I know that. But just a quick recap of why we care about these objects, okay? First of all, they're just really cool. Genuinely, I think that's a really important reason why we why we should <clears throat> research these objects. Um, they are really, really cool objects. And um, yeah, unfortunately, that's not enough to get us any grants. So we begrudgingly have to come up with these next three reasons. Uh, first, these objects, AGN and binary AGN, are at the crossroad of our most advanced and extreme physical theories, right? Quantum physics and general relativity have a lot to say with how these black holes will behave in the most dense and chaotic environments, the cores of galaxies, okay? So it's the perfect testing ground for those theories. On top of that, their evolution could be a good proxy for us to understand how galaxies evolve better and thus the history of our universe as a whole, right? It'd be a, a way that we could test our models, okay? Either, either by population studies or specific case-by-case -case studies. Finally, these binary systems are an MMA astrophysicist's dream, right? They're literally the perfect sandbox or laboratory for uh, for light GW, uh, not mixed martial arts, sorry, multi-messenger astrophysics, okay? So it's the perfect ground for us to test all of these new theories and models, and uh, it's going to be a way that we can kick in the door on this stuff. So, yeah, it's a really exciting topic. Now, to get into the specifics of my research, all right? So I work on detecting these objects or how we can detect these objects using light, all right? So here's the main idea on how we do that. First of all, we've got to spot one of these guys. Luckily, we've been doing that for over 100 years, so we've got a catalog of more than 100,000 of AGM, and we're probably going to have more with some, with some uh, new data that's coming. in. Then we have to observe its light curve. Light curve, by the way, means an object's brightness over time. We're just tracking its brightness over time. That's what, we, what I mean by observe its light curve. Because remember, just taking a picture of it, it's just going to look like any normal bright spot in the center of a galaxy, right? We have to observe its brightness over time to determine whether it's a binary or a singular AGM. Then where I come in, my job, is to analyze these light curves and determine if there's periodic variations in the brightness, that smooth variability, okay? <clears throat> Finally, if we determine there is periodic variability, we can use that as evidence for the fact that we may have discovered a supermassive black hole binary, and I'll explain how. There's a couple of challenges that we have to deal with, though, in the first place, okay? First off, 
astronomers are really good at finding periodic patterns in their data. Okay, this, this exercise of finding periodic variability is very common in astronomy. And this is an example of one of the challenges that we've got to deal with, which I, I guess I should say them, they're how good our data is, the quality of our data, how precise it is, and two, how much data we have. Okay, we're often limited by this. Now, this is an example of an observation of perfect, smooth, periodic variability that we have. But if we take into account realistic precision, it would look something more like this, right? A little bit more fuzzy, right? We have some uncertainties and imprecisions. Then if we take into account the fact that telescopes have a lot of objects to look at and that they can't come back to look at the same object every single day, this is more like what our observations might look like, at least in past surveys, past uh, studies, okay? If anybody can look at this and tell you there's periodic variation, they're lying to you, right? We need something more sophisticated like a machine or a computer that can analyze this more sophisticated with, with statistical models and determine if what we're looking at is actual periodic variability, okay? This challenge in the most part, or for the most part though, is minimized by the newest data that we have, right? There's a new astronomical project called LSST. It's gonna take, it's gonna take a, like the most advanced movie of the cosmos that we're, we have ever seen, right? It's gonna take data that's, that's precise to an unprecedented level, and that is taken at a pace of an unprecedented level, okay? So for the most part, we can minimize this challenge. One challenge that we can't minimize though, that we can't avoid, it's called red noise. Red noise is just a term for the random variation in brightness that an AGN undergoes, okay? And it, it, an example of this is displayed in this uh, bottom left plot, all right? This is brightness and this is uh, time on the x-axis, right? And you see these really jagged, variations that seem to have no rhyme or reason at all, right? This is the random variations that an AGN undergoes. And we think they're really just, they're, they're just due to the chaotic environment around a supermassive black hole, right? These AGN aren't very pretty things, right? They're very hot. There's objects that come crashing in and splashing material around. There's these jets that could uh, potentially be influencing the brightness that we observe, right? There's a lot of reasons that, um, that this red noise takes place. And the problem is that when we try to find a periodic signal and there's these jagged variations, it becomes a lot harder to find that very that smooth variability. And I'll uh, give you guys an example of that in the next slide. Now, another way they can affect us is that even if there isn't periodic variability, they can sometimes produce these phantom periodic signals like you see in this top right plot. Okay, this is this is an AGN light curve, right? This is an actual observation of a singular AGN light curve that we have. And at first glance, it almost looks like there's that smooth down and up periodic variability. But through further statistical analysis, we realize that this isn't periodic variability. This is literally just a random variation that looks a lot like periodic variability. All right. So this is the demonstration of how we get from a smooth periodic signal to something that's more complicated to analyze. So we've got a periodic signal. Now let's add in some red noise. All right. Already, it looks pretty messy. It's, it's a lot harder to find that underlying red smooth variability. And still, we'll be able to. But now, let's take into account that cadencing that I was talking about. The fact that telescopes can't take pictures of the same object every couple of days, and that we have to wait something more like a couple of weeks or maybe even a couple of months in some cases. Now, you might be able to see, because I kind of walked us through it, this up and down periodic variability, but it's a much harder thing to do in practice when we have no prior knowledge going into it. Right, it's a little bit harder to detect that true periodic signal. Okay, so we need to build a machine that takes a light curve as input, just like we we went over in the past slide. Takes a light curve as input and outputs two things. One, it tells us whether or not it thinks there's periodic variability or whether it thinks it's just random. And two, it has to inform us about what that periodic variability looks like. Right, how frequent are the variations? How extreme are the variations? Okay. And these parameters will help us characterize the orbit of the supermassive black hole binary. Because remember, the changes in brightness are coming from the black holes approaching and receding and approaching and receding. So if the variations are really high, that means they're moving really fast. If they're very frequent, that means they're a lot closer together than we might have thought. Okay. So we've got a machine that takes these light curves as input and spits out two results. Then we've got to come up with a test, basically. We're going to simulate a thousand light curves or more than a thousand light curves. Half of them are going to be singular AGN, meaning purely random red noise variations, and the other half are going to be binary AGN, which means they're going to have those random variations, but
but also they'll have a periodic signal, a periodic variability underlying it. Then we're going to quiz our machine and evaluate how it does. Basically, evaluate its outputs versus our inputs, our simulation inputs. Okay. Now, the actual uh, architecture of the machine is pretty complicated. It gets really, really specific, like I mentioned. If anybody has more specific questions, if you've done time series analysis, I'm more than happy to talk about all this stuff. Um, but right now, I'm just going to do a little bit more of a surface level overview. So the first two methods, GLS and WWZ, WWZ is not a wrestling, it's, it's the science term. Um, they compare AGN light curves to different sine waves. Okay, so different sine waves, and, and by the way, a sine wave is just this guy, right? That smooth periodic variability. It compares different sine waves of different frequencies, meaning it stretches or it, it squishes and stretches the sine waves, different frequencies and different amplitudes, right? And whichever whichever frequency and amplitude of the sine wave matches the data the best, that's what it will go with. It'll say there's periodicity of this period and of, of this amplitude exhibited in the data, okay? Now, the advantage of this method or of these two methods is that they're really, really, really quick, okay? Some, in some cases, even if they have a lot of data to analyze, they can analyze a light curve completely and determine whether or not there's periodicity in a couple minutes, maybe one minute, you know, two minutes, three minutes. Disadvantage wise though, because they're only looking for a periodic signal and they're not accounting for those random variations, they're extra susceptible to being tricked by those random variations, by that red noise, right? And on top of that, they require this, this method that we're going to go over in a minute uh, in order to have the best performance, okay? But overall, really, really quick, really good first option. Now, the second method is called the NBS, the nested Bayesian sampler. It's a lot more sophisticated. Okay, sorry. Now, what the NBS will do is it takes a light curve and it tries to match two different models to our light curve. The first model is a, a model of pure red noise. Okay, it's, the, it's our model that we use to model singular AGN light curves, just those random variations. And I know it sounds weird, random variations modeling them. We have a model to, to roughly model these random variations, and it's the red noise model. Additionally, we're going to match this red noise plus periodic variability model, which represents the, the type of light curves we'd see from binary AGN. Okay. Then, after we asking the NBS to match both of these models, to our light curve, we're going to ask it, which does it prefer? Which model does it think matches our data better? Okay. And if it prefers this model, the periodic variability model, we can use that as evidence to say that, okay, this light curve most likely has periodic variability in it. Okay. And I have a quick analogy for that. Imagine you wanted to get your friend's opinion on a couple outfits, right? You come out with your shirt and your pants, you come out looking nice and they're like, it's all right, six out of 10. Okay. Then you go back in your closet. And all you do is you grab a jacket and you put it on, okay? Shirt, pants, still the same. All you do is add a jacket, right? And you come out and your friend's like, oh, that's fire, nine out of 10, okay? Since all we did was add the jacket in, right? The, the underlying stuff is the same. All we did was add the jacket. We can attribute that change in rating from six to nine. We can attribute that change in rating to the jacket, right? It's the same exact thing. Because all we changed from this model to this model was adding periodic variability. If the NBS prefers this periodic model, we can attribute that preference to this to the periodic variations, right? We can say there's evidence that there's periodic variations in this light curve. Okay. Hopefully that analogy cleared it up. It was fun to draw. Um, but yeah, so this NBS, being that it accounts for the random variations, it's a lot more sophisticated. Okay. And advantage-wise, that means it isn't as easy to trick, right? It doesn't fall trapped to these random variations and mistake them for periodic variations as often, okay? So it's very good in that regard. On the other hand, disadvantage-wise, it's painstakingly slow, okay? And I'm getting PTSD just thinking about it. Whereas GLS and WWZ might take a couple minutes to run a light curve, the NBS can take as long as two days to run a light curve, okay? And that's because it's a significant improvement on already complicated statistical models, which for those who know, um, NBS is basically a, a significant improvement on MCMC sampler, samplers, all right? Uh, there's some specifics about the Bayesian method that it uses that make it a lot better and prevent it from falling into local minima of parameter space. Um, but overall, that makes it a lot slower and that makes it tricky to run all the way through sometimes. 
Okay, so we've got the structure, the architecture of our machines. Now, all we've got to do is just do the simulations, right? We're going to simulate our light curves, feed them to our machine, and then analyze its results, see how it did. Now, before we do that, I want to quiz you guys. Okay, this is the third poll. If you can, uh, if you can launch it, Christian. Each of these light curves have random variations. Okay, some of them may have periodic variations. Which do you think do? Okay, I'm just gonna do this to, to illustrate the power of our machines and and just how hard the eye test really is for this stuff. Um, but yeah, yeah, I'll give you guys a minute to think about it to look at it. Um, but yeah. And you have multiple, you can choose multiple answers on this one, right? So, yep. yes. yes. And I'm not trying to make you guys do my job. I've already looked at these light curves. Trust me. I don't need um, these extra opinions, but it's just fun to make you guys suffer like I've suffered. Yeah, it's really tough. I know to me, I've looked at these light curves repeatedly over the last year and still it's it's just it's really hard to compare the eye test to these machines, these sophisticated models. Sebastian, can you give a quick just a quick thing on on the x axis? What time are we talking about? You've got days, but you've got sixty thousand and so on. Is how much is that in years? Just quickly converting this so we have a an idea what you're talking about here. So this is about ten years. These are about ten years. 10 okay, scales of ten years. It's a great okay. question. Yeah, yeah, because binaries would take these. They're so big. That although they're moving really fast, we'd expect that they orbit each other anywhere from once every 30 days to once every 10 years. Right. right? right. So that's kind of the scale. And this MGD, moder modified Julian date, it's just uh, a different way to keep track of days um, for those of you who are confused, but it's literally just a time scale of days. Incredible. Sorry if that was confusing. That's okay. Okay, I will share this now. Wow. <laughs> what okay. do you think? <laughs> okay okay yeah nice nice you now nah, you guys got some futures in astrophysics you guys should join me on this project this is pretty good so <laughs> most of you said light curve one and light curve three had periodic variability still about half said light curve two some of you said none answer is light curve one and light curve two have periodic variability light curve three does not all right so i tricked you guys a little bit you know um but here's the interesting thing that i wanted to point out Light curve one, I mean, who would have guessed that this was the periodic variability in light curve one? I know that's it's difficult for the eye test. It's so difficult that both of our machines actually failed in identifying that periodic variability. So for those of you who said light curve one, maybe join me on this project. You're clearly better than my machines. I've worked on this for a year and they're still not as good as you. So um, yeah, I just kind of wanted to illustrate that even our machines, as sophisticated as they are, can still be really wrong sometimes. As for light curve two, they were both dead on, both resounding yeses. They found this light curve periodicity really, really strongly. Um, and as for light curve three, they all agreed that there was no periodic variability, which is interesting because like I think 60% of you said that there was. You know, it's really easy to get fooled by these, these uh, long scale variations, right? It's easy to attribute them to periodic variability. That's why we have these models. Sebastian, so, yeah. I'd have to throw in a quick question. This is fascinating. I mean, how can you be so certain that light curve one definitely is yes? I mean, what gives you that certain that 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 incredible confidence? Because I simulated it. <laughs> okay. Because, so yeah. Okay, yeah. that's the answer. Okay. Good. Yeah. 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 Good, if, good. if these no, it would be a crazy deal if I like found these light curves and had that much confidence about it. But no, what I is? simulated all yeah. these guys. Yep. So okay. I like did the math of doing this sinusoid plus some red noise variability, just like I did a couple slides ago. Um, and it ended up being, yeah, yeah, it does have periodic variability. That makes sense, thank you. Yeah, you won't find me that confident about real light curves. I've got, I'm clueless when it comes to those things. Um, but yeah, okay. So yeah, that was fun, thank you guys. Now we can see how our actual machines did. Now, to be honest with you guys, uh, this, is, this stuff gets really complicated really quickly. It gets really specific. So I'm just kind of guy, kind of gonna kind of give you, sorry, a, a surface level overview. So generally, what we see, and this is illustrated in these right plots, is that our peak accuracy, classification accuracy, which is singular AGN light curves, were classified as not having periodic variability, and binary AGN were classified as having periodic variability. In terms of classification accuracy, the NBS does the best. 
Okay, it's, it's at its peak, it's about 83 to 84% accuracy. The other two methods are both about tied at like 83, 80, I'm sorry, 78, 79% accuracy. Overall, NBS outperforms them, but in general, this is just a good result. The fact that we're correctly classifying about 80% of these objects is a huge, huge deal, right? And um, it, it'll bode well for when we actually start applying this stuff to real data. Okay, um, if, if you guys have more questions about this stuff, I'm more than happy to talk about it. In terms of characterization, which is, okay, great, there's periodic variability, but what does it look like, right? What's its frequency? What's its amplitude? In general, once again, we found that the WWZ is about is pretty much the worst method. It, it doesn't characterize as well as the other two, although it does a decent job. GLS is a close second, um, and the NBS is definitely the best, okay? This is a good result. Once again, in terms of pitting them against each other, we can make, you know, we can make specific claims like NBS is better than GLS, but in general, it's just good to know that we recover a lot of the orbital parameters or the, sorry, the periodic parameters with good accuracy, with good precision. Okay. And I know these plots are incredibly complicated. I, I don't understand you guys to get this. I haven't explained them, but if you guys are interested in talking about it a little bit more, I'm more than happy to detail it. Um, but in general, we find that we recover these periodic parameters pretty, pretty well. You know, overall, these these methods work well on their own, but when we synergize them, we find that the results improve a lot. And that's a big deal because that hasn't been done before in this field of research. So I'm, I'm hoping to publish that uh, soon in my paper. Now, I know we're pretty much on 40 minutes, but just real quick, I'm going to touch on the future of this research. OK, so for one, there's improvements we can make to our model. Right. There's different types of periodic variations. There's not just that smooth up and down. Sometimes these objects can share, we think, can share a circumbinary accretion disk that goes around both of the supermassive black holes. And in that case, orbitally, they might periodically crash into the super into the accretion disk, causing periodic spikes in brightness, right? That's a different type of variability, but we could build a model for it. And if that's the case, we could detect more of these systems potentially. On top of that, oops. We can use gravitational waves, like I said. We can start using some multi-messenger astrophysics. Um, the science of this, it's it's called using pulsar timing arrays. Incredibly complicated, like I said. I'll talk about it if you guys are interested, of course. But um, the idea is that we do, we'd be looking at these systems from a completely different lens. So we could use GW observations to uncover different uh, features about the light we'd expect to see, and vice versa. All right. Finally. Artificial intelligence applications, there's plenty of them. I actually emailed two professors that work on these projects that I'll be working with at Vanderbilt next year. Um, they And they gave me just some quick rundowns of where they think AI could come into this. And um, here's just a couple of them listed. I think the chat GPT for light curves is the most interesting where instead of learning to communicate with language and learning relations between words, chat GPT or in artificial intelligence thing, a program or an algorithm could learn how to communicate in the language of light curves, so to speak, um, learn to identify random variability versus periodic variability a little bit better. Um, but yeah, all of these are really interesting applications of AI. And yeah, like I said, the field is not going to stop anytime soon. This project is going to keep going for the next couple of years, hopefully, and uh, open up a lot of new doors. But yeah, that's all I got. That's my presentation. So thank you guys a lot for, for paying attention. Um, I really appreciate the live audience. So thank you guys. Thank you so much, Sebastian. If you don't mind, stop sharing so we can see you better. And then, uh, well, oh, that that was an absolute amazing, fantastic talk. I, I'm I'm just really um, com com completely overwhelmed. Uh, really, really, really fascinating. Also, that you're going to go next year to fund a build uh, and and uh, work work on your PhD. So I've got two quick questions, and then I will pass it on to the audience. The one is that's is very interesting that you said when you have these supermassive binary uh black holes coming very close you were talking about a, a light year i think in one thing a light year and i thought to myself you know if light comes from the sun we know it takes about eight minutes and that's a straight line for us that's what we call it. but if you have this incredible warped space time what on earth does a light year even mean i mean you know i can't i can't even put my mind to it because it must be so warped that i don't understand how we measure what a what a light year is can you comment on that or is it impossible to say anything about that yeah i'll try my best but <laughs> yeah so when we're talking about a light year it's it's incredible right because you think that eight minute figure 
uh, a light year, I mean, it wouldn't even make sense to, to cite how long it is in kilometers. But one thing that helped me was that, okay, we look at black holes at separations of a thousandth of a light year. So a thousandth of that distance. And yet and still, it would be like, a, okay, resolving them would be like looking at the moon and identifying two grains of sand that are an inch apart, right? Resolving those two inches. So although it's a really, really far distance, it's it's minuscule cosmically, right? It, it's almost nothing cosmically. And um, compared to the size of the black holes, if you put a black hole in the place of our sun, it would, it, or at least a really super massive black hole, sorry, it could expand out to the to the radius, the orbital radius of Neptune, right? Of almost of Neptune or at least of Jupiter, right? Which is an incredible distance. But for those giants, a light year is really nothing, right? It's like looking face to face at that point. A separation of a light year or a thousandth of a light year is nothing. That's how big these objects are. But in terms of the actual scale of a light year, I guess I don't have many many good analogies for it. But um, it is incredible to think about, and it's it's yeah. hard to just throw these words around when they mean so much, you know. But yeah, and and of course the other other question is 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 more an obvious one because I mean the light curve simulation, and you show the complexity of adding all this noise. But it's it's far more complex than even that. I mean, if you if I just imagine if there are two sort of binary black holes and it's a big difference whether it's an edge on problem, a face on or a combination of these. I mean, how on earth would you even, you know, untangle this? This looks so complex to me, right? It is. It, and, it, and it is. And the thing is, we're actually trying to at least I am thinking about incorporating those orbital parameters into this this model because right now that smooth variation only picks up edge on circular right. orbits but right. if we do the inclination and eccentricity the type of periodic variability is completely different based on the boosting so you know we've definitely got to take those into consideration as well okay so that's something you're working on that's great yeah. okay so i'll jump now to the question and answer sikanda very nice so sikanda's first question is what causes an AGN, an active galactic uh, nuclei, to have either positive feedback or negative feedback? I think you touched a bit on it. so Just a little bit. And honestly, this the specifics of AGN feedback isn't necessarily my uh, exact field. But um, generally, the magnetic fields that we talked about that cause those negative AGN feedback probably require um, a lot of charged material, right? Magnetic fields are formed from funneling charged material. So if we just have a lot of static zero charge material, we're not going to form those magnetic fields, those strong hydrodynamic medical uh, magnetic fields that can form those relativistic jets. Um, on the other hand, if if a black hole is shining at its maximum limit, it's going to cause those those outward positive uh, flows, right? It's it's just a matter of fact of how many photons it's spread, it's uh, sending out into the universe and into the galaxy. Sorry. Good. Thank you. Okay, and Richard is coming more from an experimental point of view or observational. I joined your excellent ses uh, session late. Sorry, you may have already covered it. No, you did not. Our M81 and M82 approximately to, uh, a part of your studies. So not right now. And the okay. reason behind that is we're all doing simulation work, right? Mm -hmm. We're all just preparing this machine, basically putting it through the ringer before we apply it to real data. Because I, I did apply it to real data at one point and it, the results were a little bit weird. And then I had some additional ideas to like maybe improve the model. So we took a step back just doing at home data, but in the next couple of years, hoping to apply to some real data. Um, okay. M81, we have an, I think we have an image of the AGN and M81 and it's a singular supermassive black hole. So we wouldn't necessarily want oh, to, right. we wouldn't necessarily think there's a binary there, but still a really good question. You know, they, they're the closest, they might give us the best observations. And Peter, do you use Feynman diagrams for these tasks? I do not. No, I do not. No. Yeah. Sorry, okay. I wish I had a better answer. That's, yeah, that's, a, that's a clear answer. Carlos, uh, what happens if both black holes are roughly the same mass? So, then the okay. brightness changing effect that I talked about will most likely cancel out. Fantastic question. Ah, good. Fantastic question. Good. They have to be different brightnesses for that effect to be very ah. notable. Okay. Oh, very, very smart question. Thank At you, Carlos. Time, though, real quick, just to touch on it. Yes, of if course. Even mass, the mm -hmm. gravitational waves that they emit will be the most strong. Okay. Right. So for the light to be most detectable, it's advantageous for one to be way bigger than the other. But for the GWs to be uh, detectable, it's advantageous for them to be roughly similar mass. 
that's the multi messenger that you were talking about, right? Okay. Interesting. Okay. But I, I think these gravitational, you, you would have to go to very low frequencies. So we don't have that yet, right? To, to go to. With PTAs? Yeah. Yes. No, no. With PTAs, we're going ah, to. It, okay. It's still in development. I can talk about that. But yeah. It's, okay. It's, no, it's just a quick question because it was. Okay. Michael, um, uh, would just Fourier transforming mm -hmm. these light curves not work well? Oh, that's beautiful strong. question. Great question. That's exactly what I asked my yes. advisor when she first gave me this project. I'm like, you guys are wasting your time. Just Fourier. <laughs> That's right. But the thing with Fourier transform is one, it deals terribly with additional noise. And two, it needs evenly sampled data for the most part. Okay. And in, in, in astronomy, we have seasonal gaps where we can't see a certain object from certain parts of the earth. So we just can't get that evenly sampled data. And on top of that, we're dealing with these high levels of noise. Fourier transform just isn't able to keep up with these other methods, but still a really good question. Well, that's a good good answer. Thank you. Ian, when you're looking at the characterization accuracy, how do you know that you're not missing something better characterized by another method? Huh? Um so if I think I think I might understand your question. Um I so we take all of the characterization characterizations into account. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, when we apply this to real data, we won't have any real simulation data to compare it against. So we're going to have to take all of them with some grain of salt. Now, mm -hmm. the reason we evaluate them individually is because we want to know, okay, for the NBS, how good is its characterization accuracy? How much stock can we put in its guesses of the frequency or the amplitude, right? How much stock can we put in the GLS's guesses of frequency and amplitude and so on and so forth? We have to characterize them individually so we're prepared to interpret them uh, you know, together on um, you know, on a on a larger scale when we do some real data analysis. Yeah, interesting. Very good. Uh, Richard, again, um, if possible, please define uh, synergize approximately forty minutes into your presentation, taking the data and as I'm an old grump, <laughs> and uh, yeah, tend to question terminology. Okay. Love this question. So I can't get so so specific, but basically. GLS and WWZ classify a light curve by comparing how likely it is that a purely noise red curve, that a purely noise light curve generated a stronger response, uh, a, a stronger signal detection than the than the subject light curve. Okay, so comparing pure noise to our subject light curve, which could be noise, might not. Now, those simulations of pure noise, if we just use a random distribution of, of parameters, of mm -hmm. time scale and variability parameters for that red noise, we get a decent estimation of how likely it is that there's periodic variability. But if we use the nested Bayesian sampler first to fit this light curve with that red noise model, with that random variation model, we can get guesses for the parameters of the red noise model and then get a more specific, uh, a, a better estimation of how likely it is that the specific type of red noise we're seeing in this light curve generated a periodic signal uh, detection. Okay, I know that's it's very complicated, very great, but that's how we can use uh, NBS to synergize and, and improve the the guesses of the other methods. Yeah, and George comes up with an interesting question here. Out of the hundred thousand uh, active galactic nuclei, how many do you think of them are actually binary? Do you have any any estimate for that? So there's a paper that used generalized or that used GLS in mm -hmm. a similar study, and they applied it to I think 127,000 or no, like 180,000 AGN, and wow. they found that only 127 of them showed remotely enough evidence for periodic variability. Okay, so wow, so super rare. So super rare. Now that study might have been a little bit flawed, you know, whatever the case may be. Um, they did good work but it's potential that that number could change, but they only found, you know, less than a percent. Arthur, but how do you correlate gravitational wave observations with light observations, given the low angular resolution of gravitational wave uh, obs uh, observatories? That's a good one, yes. Fantastic question. Right now, we don't, okay? Mm -hmm. um, we're, we're actively researching that, and the, the interesting thing is, with uh, typical gravitational wave uh, observatories like LIGO and Virgo, and even the new one that's coming out uh, in a couple of years, hopefully, LISA, yeah. um, the angular resolution is pretty poor, but mm -hmm. compared to nanohertz frequency gravitational waves, it's really, really good. Okay, so right now we use a system called pulsar timing arrays to detect these really slow gravitational waves. Right. And 
right now, our angular resolution is, is really, really bad when we're talking about the time scales that we have. So we don't correlate those observations yet, but um, improvements to those methods are being currently researched. Um, I'm not super well versed in that, but I'm definitely going to be learning about it when I go to Vanderbilt in, uh, in 2025 and start that research as well. Very good. Okay, Michael, you see how, how much interest there is, <laughs> Sebastian. If you have a binary orbiting SMBH system, um, one would be moving, ah, here we go, Doppler, one would be moving towards us and the other moving away from us. Wouldn't the changes in brightness cancel each other out? Okay, it's interesting, yes. So I think I touched on this a little bit yes, earlier. If they have the same intrinsic brightness, you're 100% right. But if one black hole is way more massive than the other, we'd expect that most of the material aggregates around the smaller black hole meaning the smaller black hole shines really bright while the large one is a little darker. So this effect would be more noticeable. Great very question. Yeah. Fantastic Good question. questions. You're going to see there's some very knowledgeable audience here. Uh, so Zeef is saying, would you expect difference in the merging galaxy structure due to their merging black holes? So, Great question. Um, yeah. I, don't, I, I wish I knew better. Um, mm. I will say, interestingly enough, in several, in, in many galaxies, we found that the mass of a supermassive black hole is correlated to how quickly the stars in its co in its core are rotating. Okay, right. which is, is it's an insane fact. the The black hole, just using like typical, just using basic gravitational calculations, shouldn't be able to exert that type of control over the gal the galactic core. Okay, it shouldn't right. be able to. Do that, but we see those correlations. Okay, based on that. I feel like the dynamics of the merger or the specifics of the merging black holes could influence the eventual dynamics of the galaxy as well. Because we know that the galaxies that we see that correlation in that, that uh, pattern in, mm -hmm. they probably came from other mergers, right? And that merger outcome most likely had to do with the supermassive black hole interaction, or it might have had to do with it. Interesting. Very yeah. good. good well, great questions. That brings us to the end of the presentation. So, Sebastian, thank you so much. What a great uh, presentation. We absolutely enjoyed it. You could see from the audience, we we really loved it. Um, I thank hope you. that when you go to Thunderbolt in 2025, that maybe in a year or two, we'll see you again. And okay. you can give us an update on this very fascinating topic. So thank you very much. And thank you to all our audience. Uh, thanks for being there and supporting our telescope in this. And um, as you know, we are we we very much support education, especially for for young people. We will be opening a Patreon channel very so, very soon, so that we can support even more graduate uh, PhD students and so on, and we can continue with our webinar series. On that uh, note, have a wonderful weekend, everyone, and happy summer or winter wherever you may be.